we will speak now about the lips. But before we speak about the lip, I want to remind you, as I said before, all the components are codependent. I will give you an example. If you have a stereo system and you have wonderful speakers, but one of the cables is not working, that's it. That's it. It's not working. Or if you have a CD player or maybe I'm too old fashioned. I don't know what you're using nowadays, but every component is equally important. So when one component is not working well, then you move on. You look for the answer in your lips where your throat is not working well. Won't work. You look for the answer in your mouth, but you don't support. Won't work. So I remind you, check everything before you move on. I will give you an example. When I was in high school days, studying with one of my teachers, I had this habit, I don't know where I got it from, but it, I found it very helpful. On my music stand, I always used a piece of paper and I wrote down three to five points that at the moment, at that day or at, in this week, were very important for me. Let's say support, let's say lips, let's say staccato, whatever. I would put them on the piece of paper. On this other side, there was whatever I played, etude or scale or the piece of music that I was preparing. But I always kept looking on this paper on the right, checking the points. First point, check. Going to the second, check. Third, check, four, check, five, check, and back. Once this was working for me, after like two, three, four times of going down this list, I could throw this piece of paper. The next day or the next week, I had a new paper because something else bothered me. Maybe it was legato. Maybe it was vibrato. So I really encourage you, and we will speak later on about practicing in another chapter, just take it slow with a lot of patience. Good. So now let's get back into the lips. This was the order. No? We started from bottom to the lips, then will come the flute. The lips are, of course, very delicate. They form the, the air at the end of the flow of the air. They form it. And as we are all different, we all have different lips. So I cannot say that there is one way of ambajou formation that would work perfectly for everyone. Some have uh, thicker lips, some have um, thinner lips, broader, etc., etc., etc. I would say so. If it works for you, perfect. I just give you maybe a few points that might help. Okay? So, if you think of the lips like this, rubber band, no? When you uh, pull it, no? On the sides, in the center, it forms itself. Maybe, maybe it's easier to see here. When I kind of stretch or kind of smile, the embouchure is formed, then I don't need any pressure or hardly any pressure. I just form it here. I know that there are other ways to look at embouchure, but I found out with myself and with many, many, many students that it works. This is one point. Second point to remember is that the flute is not in front of us. The flute is underneath. So the angle is very important. In order to find the, the angle, we have to work with the lips, we have to, to work with the jaw, um, this is a, actually a slight movement. Now the angle is not optimal, the air is too high. In order to change it, I take my jaw a bit back. And the air goes into the flute. Okay, but it's a small movement, don't, don't, don't overdo it. 
Another point concerns the upper lip. And this maybe would be a bit hard to see, but I, I will explain to you the, the principle. If those are the lips, upper and lower, in order to blow the air, not straight, but down, the upper lip actually has a lot of effect on the angle of the air. So I do kind of this movement, so back and I roll it a bit. So instead of I do, but don't confuse it with pressing. When I press, I get this noise because the air spreads. So I form it here, as I said, like the rubber band, and then I help with the upper lip to let the air inside, okay? Some people confuse this or they don't know it. So instead of doing all that, they cover or they close the mouth hole to get the angle. The problem here is that when we cover the mouth hole, we lose a lot of surface where we should blow air. And in this way, we lose overtone, we lose richness of the sound. It's like if this is the, the wall where we blow air and we cover the flute, we lose a lot of surface, yeah? So then we have a smaller, let's say, smaller mouth hole and less possibilities in the sound less overtones and intonation problems. And this I will uh, explain. So what is the right angle? What is the right aperture of the mouth hole? Is this too open or too closed? Of course, the second one is the open one, too open. The first one is too closed. So what do we do? We take, I take, two notes, uh, a fifth apart, for instance, a D and an A. Why I take a D and an A? Because the D we call a long note, meaning that the tube is long, and the A, the tube is short. Yeah, the air goes up till here. By D, it's much longer. Or we take E, long, and B, short. It's a perfect fifth. What happens is that the longer notes, they bend much less by opening and closing or covering, and the shorter notes are very flexible, they move a lot. So, when I cover too much, since the shorter note, the A, moves a lot down, the fifth is too small. When I open up too much, the shorter note moves high too much, and then the fifth is too big. So I would say that the optimal position When I compare two notes, I know more or less, ah, this is a good position. And once you find a good position, this would basically, 95% of the time, would be your position for all the range of the flute and all dynamics level. You don't need to move. If you have a good enough flute, your intonation will be almost 100%. Of course, there are always some notes that we have to keep correcting. But this we will discuss later on the chapter of intonation.